Thanks, George. Especially John, is now it okay to get started? started? <laughs> yeah, I think so. All right, thanks. Um, so I'll be going over the basics of ECHO. I've, I've given this lecture uh, over the last several years, and one thing that I've done differently, I think with the help of John and, and Sergey, is focus a little bit on on what you all think is important as you go into the OR in the beginning, uh, and then kind of things that you want to get a little background, things that you want to start to think about as you're, you're kind of finishing the fellowship. So I'll essentially be using this. I've made the very beginning of the echo um, focused on just the basics, and then we'll go through the views so that everyone kind of understands what they're looking at. Um, one of the challenges I'd like to start with this slide when you try to learn echo is that every book will tell you that you need to memorize all of these views. And my hope in doing this is that you will recognize that there are a few very basic views that you need to know. And from that, you will start to understand the anatomy and, and start to understand the other more complicated views. Um, but this is certainly not the way to learn echo. And so one of the things that um, I encourage you to do is to, when you start learning basic TEE or TTE, stick with the basic views. And it's important to know the name of the views as well, because you can ask a sonographer or the, whoever is doing, doing the echo to obtain that view and they will know exactly what you're looking for. It's certainly easier than saying, can I look at the mitral, you know, in that one view where it looks like uh, it's easier for people, especially the sonographers, they're trained to understand uh, the views that they're asked to get. And so I would encourage you to just memorize the basic uh, views that you'll need. So just starting with TEE, there are four basic views. You have the four chamber view here on the top. Um, you'll notice the right atrium is kind of cut off here, and we'll talk a little bit about that. You have your mid-esophageal long axis view. You have your mid-esophageal bicable view, and you have your short axis view. So we're just going to start with those four basic TEE views. And the next part, obviously, will be to think of the four basic TTE views. You have a parasternal long axis view, a parasternal short axis view, an apical four chamber view and a subcostal view. And what you will notice uh, as you start to think of the basic views, if you only live in the OR or if you're only looking at TTEs pre-op, you will recognize TEE views if you understand TTE and vice versa. And the reason for that, if you think of the anatomy and where you're looking at the echo, um, all of the images are mirror images of each other. And so if you think of your TEE probe, it's going down in the esophagus. So you're looking at the heart from behind. And anytime you're looking at the echo, the top of the screen is where your probe starts. So we'll just kind of use that as a, as a starting point. And then if you think of your TTE, then you're coming around to the anterior part here. And this is essentially your probe. And you know right up front that you're almost never able to get this close to the heart from the, with your TTE probe. In fact, depending on the patient, you may be starting way out here. And then by the time you add chest tubes and whatnot, the image is actually pretty poor. Um, so I think that was one of the first questions on here. You know, why is, are the TTE images so much better? Well, it's because you sit right behind the heart and so you live in the near field. And so this is why in complicated cases or patients where you're really unsure of the hemodynamics, the TEE images are all, almost always uh, so much better. But uh, just thinking about this, it's important to realize that the images are just mirror images of each other. So if you really start to learn TEE, you will then start to understand the focus of the, what the images on the TTE look like. Um, the other piece that they asked me to discuss briefly was the, the Doppler. And so everything that you get on echo is by Doppler. And there are essentially um, two modes. You can have pulse mode and continuous wave. And the, the thing to keep in mind here is that in a pulse wave, um, you set the, uh, where you wanna look at the, um, the speed of the blood. So if you look at this little square box here, you're essentially setting the area that you wanna look at. And then it will tell you, okay, this is the velocity in this specific area. With continuous wave, it's different. It gives you the highest velocity along the entire column here. 
So if you think of uh, like the, the submarine videos, if you're looking for a, a ship and you're waiting for uh, the echo image to come back, you can essentially fix the distance, but you don't know the speed. The alternative is to switch to a continuous wave and then you know the speed of whatever's coming, but you don't necessarily know uh, where it's coming from. So the way to really think about this and the way that this will become useful for you in the OR on the floor is if you want to know if there's a gradient across the valve or you want, you want to start with continuous wave because that will tell you right up front, okay, do we have a problem or not? And it will look at the entire column here and you will be able to say, okay, the highest velocity that we have or the highest pressure that we have is say 50. If you know that, then you say, okay, we have a problem. The mean gradient shouldn't be 50 anywhere across this part of the heart. And then what you do is you take pulse wave and then you try to localize, okay, where is that velocity coming from? So people in general will start with continuous wave, discern whether there's a problem. And so then you know, okay, there's a, say a, a torpedo um, uh, coming and it's coming fast and you say, okay, that's a problem. And then you wanna try to figure out, okay, where exactly is it right now? And, and so for that reason, people will fixate on continuous wave because that will tell you whether or not you have a problem. And assuming that you know the pathology going in, it's pretty safe to say that's where you're uh, running into issues. Um, the other thing to keep in mind anytime you're doing Doppler is there's always an angle effect. So um, every, believe it or not, every velocity or every pressure gradient that you're getting is almost certainly underestimated. And the reason for that is it's very hard to line the beam up in the direction of uh, the, the valve or the, the blood that you're looking at. So there's a cosine factor in, in the Doppler shift. And this is important because depending on the sonographer, um, some will be excellent at making sure that they, they give you a good view and, and, and then from that you will get an accurate pressure velocity reading and, and others less so. And so you need to look at the image or ask them, do you have a good enough view to be able to say this is a high or a low velocity? And it's a cosine factor. So if the cosine is zero, meaning they've been able to line the transducer up with the valve, um, you're not downgrading the, the, the pressure gradient at all. If though the transducer is set at 90 degrees, it's gonna completely throw off the number that you receive. So let's take a look at an image and see how that's important. Um, so if you're thinking this is your, your parasternal view and your aortic valve is like this, right? It's coming, mm -hmm. coming across, the, the blood is coming from the LV out through the aorta. Every image that you start with, the beam on your echo is starting from the top. So when you start to shoot down, you'll notice that you are not in line with the blood flow. And so you're not able to use the numbers that you're getting in terms of the velocity or the pressure to say how bad this valve is. Um, so you can see color and if it's turbulent, you can say there's likely a problem, uh, but you should never use these numbers to say, okay, the pressure gradient is say 50. This is kind of what you want to see. So what they've done is they've now lined this up so that the aortic valve and the, the LV is close to the top of the screen and the blood is going in this direction. Now, when you start from the top, you can line this up and you will get an accurate velocity or pressure across the valve. So that I think is incredibly important. And that's why you'll notice in the OR, particularly when you're talking about valves, they're doing very deep views and the reason for that is not to obtain a better view it's to make sure that the actual lv outflow track is lined up with the top of the screen so that they can get an accurate pressure measurement so that's important when you start looking particularly post bypass to make sure that you have an appropriate fix questions about that Um, so the other thing that um, we were asked to discuss was just basic echo dimensions. It's important to have uh, a general sense of what's big and what's small. And the two ones that they've asked me to focus on are the LV and the left atrium. So you'll notice that all of these, uh, the sizes come from the echo lab that you're coming from. And in an effort to make this simple, what you'll notice is that the, the important LV measurement is always in end diastole. If it's less than four centimeters, people will say that's small because that's close to the 37 millimeter cutoff. 
if it's greater than five centimeters that you can consider that a big LV. The left atrium also, if you remember just four and five centimeters, if you're doing it in the AP view, anything greater than four centimeters is con considered big. If you're doing superior, inferior, medial lateral, anything greater than five centimeters is considered big. So really, I think as a general uh, starting point, think, try to remember four and five centimeters and anything bigger than, anything larger than five will be important. And the question then will become, well, how is this important to me? Why do I need to understand the size of the left ventricle? So I'll give you a, a perfect example of that and, and why, uh, um, particularly in the ICU, uh, the ejection fraction, although useful, doesn't tell you the entire story. And this is why I think uh, when you're reading numbers, everyone's so fixated on the cardiac output. Um, and the, if you think about it, um, there, there are basically um, two different ways that you could consider the patient being in heart failure. I think everyone will report an EF of 5% and say, okay, the heart is bad. But if you, if you take the stairs up to LSA 9, you'll notice most of those patients have EFs between 5 and 20%, but they're not shocky, right? They're not on 80 of levofed and, and 20 of epi. And the reason is, as Greg Lewis likes to point out, they have big eight centimeter ventricles. So if you're taking 5% of a huge ventricle, your cardiac output is actually okay. The, the uh, flip side of that is if you have an EF of 70%, people are gonna say, okay, I'm not terribly worried about an EF of 70%. But if the ventricle was very small, 70% of a small cavity will still only give you an output of two liters. So if someone says there's an EF of 5%, the next thing that you should look at on the echo report or you should ask them if they're in the room is how big is the ventricle? And that will give you a sense of the stroke volume. So both of these um, are, are low output, but the EFs are, are very different. And so the patients that uh, you wanna think about in terms of responding to inotropes are the kind of big dilated LV patients. And that's why they can hang out on LSN9 for so long awaiting a heart transplant. It's that if you take that EF of 5% and you put them on inotropes and you're able to double that EF to say 10%, then you've effectively increased the cardiac output and the stroke volume because the size yeah. of the cavity is so big. And so this is the heart that, where you wanna focus on inotropes, particularly um, post bypass and those patients uh, that are in the ICU struggling. This is a very different scenario, right? And I think this is the one that, that gets us in trouble. If someone says that the EF is 70% and the output's only two liters and you start inotropes, it's, it's not likely to fix the problem because you may be able to get the EF to say 75%, but because the cavity is so small, the output is gonna remain pretty low. So this is a patient where you really need to start with a lot of volume and see if it actually changes your stroke volume because your stroke volume is essentially fixed by the EF. So that's one reason why in addition to asking about the EF, you should ask about the, the size of the LV and understand how that's important for the, the patient's hemodynamics. I'll pause there, any questions about that? The next thing to know and that you'll see is um, color Doppler. And you will get two things uh, from color Doppler. One, you will understand the speed of the blood, and that's why you have a, a miles per hour here on the screen. And the other is the direction of blood. And people will ask you to memorize blue away and red toward, and that tells you the direction of blood with respect to the, the beam that you're shooting from the top of the screen. There are clues, though, within the color Doppler. The easiest one to remember, if it's laminar flow, meaning the velocity across the valve is the same, it usually tells you you don't have a problem, and you will have a single color, meaning it will be, say, red or blue, depending on the direction of blood throughout the entire echo image. If you see something very turbulent and it's changing colors, that tells you that the velocity is changing across the valve, and that can be a sign that you have stenosis or there's something pathologic across the valve that's giving you a lot of velocities in a lot of different areas across that, uh, whatever it is essentially that you're looking at. And I think BART is an easier uh, acronym to remember if you're from the Bay Area. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I have, <laughs> coming from the Bay Area, that's right. And for anyone that knows the, the, uh, that's commuted on the, on the BART. So it's, um, if you're looking at, Color Doppler, this is actually gonna be, I think, pretty helpful. So 
just to orient you, you have the left ventricle here, and then the apex of the LV is here at the top of the screen. And the beam that when you're shooting echo always starts at the top. So I'm gonna freeze this, and then we're gonna look at the color and make sure that we understand what's going on here. Perfect. So if the apex of the left ventricle is at the top and the aortic valve is here, we're gonna make sure that we understand the color as we go from the apex out through the aorta. So it's blue, right? So it's going away uh, from the LV apex, which makes sense, right? So we're, we're kind of here in the dark blue, which is not very fast. And then you'll notice that something changes when you come across the valve, right? So uh, the velocity starts to go up because the color here goes from dark blue to light blue. So you know right away, just looking at the color without looking at anything else, that there's something that's increasing the velocity across this valve. So it's dark blue, it's lighter blue. And then all of a sudden, I don't know if you can see this, John, you'll notice that it, it turns yellow here. And this is uh, what people will talk about when they say that there's aliasing. So because the, you only go in this screen to say 50 centimeters per second, it loops back to the top. So the direction of blood has not changed. It's just that the velocity is so high that it's actually changing the color map. And so you go from yellow to now orange to red. The blood is in the same direction, but because the velocity is so high, it's looped. And so when people uh, on the echo screen, when they, they talk about flow acceleration, this is exactly what they're talking about. You can look at the color and see that the velocity of the blood is increased, which tells you there's something in here that's increasing the velocity across the valve. And, and for us, that could be say stenosis. Does that make sense? So M mode, I was actually a little surprised that uh, this initially was included, but it, it makes sense. And I'll tell you why this can be useful for you if you're in the operating room or on the floor and you start seeing these images in the report. Um, keep in mind, uh, and I, I think this is the, if you're thinking of the fish finder that, that you see on your screen, this is essentially what you'll see. And the reason for this is that M mode gives you the best temporal resolution. So when you have very fast moving structures, M mode gives you a, a very accurate depiction of how far uh, apart things are. So this is depth and this is time. And again, it's just like a fish finder. You send a, a signal out, you wait for it to bounce back. And then you know if it's bright, it's something very reflective. If it's dark, the echo just penetrates right through. So if you start here at the top of the screen, you'll see that it's dark. There's nothing here that's reflecting the echo. And then boom, right here, you'll see that it's very bright. And so that's telling you that there's actual tissue there. So the reason that people like to use M mode is that you can actually see ex exactly how far apart, say, the leaflet tips are. Just recognizing how far you are uh, down on the echo screen. So if this is the aortic valve opening, you will see that you can measure this on your M mode screen and actually be able to say, okay, the, this is the, the valve opens to say two centimeters or something like that. And so for very fast moving structures, M mode is, is your friend. It's important to recognize that M mode is in old mode. So if you remember the, the basic imaging modes, they started with A mode, which is amplitude mode. It would just, uh, you would see, um, you would get a number on a plot. B mode is brightness. So things that are highly reflective on your echo turn out very bright on the screen. M mode we just discussed, so very fast moving things, you can get accurate measurements with M mode. 2D grayscale is what we're accustomed to seeing in the OR. Um, you will see a, a 2D image and then now, the processing of the, the Philips and, and companies like that, you are, are starting to see very good 3D images. People still like to use M mode though, uh, when they're trying to measure very fast moving things. And a lot of times you'll notice that it's hard to actually get good measurements when you go to 3D imaging. All right. So this obviously you will have to memorize at some point. And uh, I think this is a good time when you start putting it and trying to understand what uh, you're trying to get from the echo. So valve areas, the ones to focus on are, if you memorize just severe and then you know the cutoff for mild, 
you will be able to understand what's mild, moderate, and severe. So less than a centimeter, one to one to five, and anything greater than 1.5. And then the mean gradient, just memorize 20 and 40. So to keep things very simple, 20 and 40 for your mean gradient, 1.5 and one centimeter for your valve area. So here's the report. You have a valve area that's less than one and you have a mean gradient greater than 40. Uh, the question, John, is what do you think is going on here? Is this a uh, real stenosis or not? My screen doesn't actually allow me to see who else is there. Travis, do you want to try? Hmm? Travis. So the valve area is less than one. Uh, so I think consistent is the aortic stenosis. Great. And then now they give you this value. You see the valve area is less than one, but the mean gradient is less than 40. Trahanis? John Trahanis, are you on? You're muted. Yeah, maybe Jordan can take it. Yeah, hey, it, hey, it's Jordan. I can take that one. So if, if uh, I, I'm sorry, Ken, my audio was, was not working as I was transitioning to home. But if if you have a valve area of less than one and a mean, mean gradient of less than 40, that doesn't necessarily tell the whole story because uh, this could still be severe aortic stenosis depending upon the patient's uh, fraction. It could also... You're cutting out a little there, but I, the first part is accurate. So... The question will be, how do you separate the two? I, I, I think you were starting Superior to get radiant, I lost. Again, low gradient. Um, so I'll take over here. So it sounds like that's right, John. So if the gradient is low, it could be that it, the flow across the valve is low. So similar to uh, when you're turning the hose on, if you put your finger on it, uh, if there's no water coming through, the gradient's going to be low. Once you turn the hose up, you will start to unmask how bad the gradient is or, or how hard you're, you're pushing on the hose. And so what, that's the, at, at that time, you will increase the flow across the valve. And this is where people will say you should start inotropes. And then you will start to understand, okay, is, do we have a problem across this valve? And one of two things will happen. Um, if it's not severe AS, the valve will actually open up. And then you know, okay, we were fooled by the fact that the output was so low. If, however, the valve stays small and the mean gradient go, goes up, then you know, okay, we have a fixed lesion or we have a pathology across that valve. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, so if you're thinking just of aortic stenosis, one easy thing to do is to look actually at the velocity curve and you will not have to know anything more, meaning if the you have a mean gradient of 40 across the valve, you know you have a problem. And if you look at just the numbers here, this is your velocity across the valve, one centimeter, two centimeters, three centimeters, four centimeters. Anything greater than four centimeters is severe. So even when they start with this screen, you can actually look at the physical screen yourself. And before they give you a pressure, you can say, okay, we have a problem. And just by memorizing, if you're, greater than four, it's severe. If you're greater than three, it's moderate. And if you're greater than two and a half, it's mild. You will know without doing any further calculations that there's something across uh, the continuous wave Doppler that's giving you a, a high velocity signal. And then the question becomes, well, how do you get a pressure gradient? Well, the reason that you can use the velocity initially is that you're just plugging the velocity into an equation and you're getting a pressure. Uh, one question that uh, people will ask, and this was included in what we should include, are the cath lab gradients higher or lower than the echo gradients in general? I remember that. Uh, in general, they're lower. Uh-huh. Great. And, and why would that be, Jordan? Any thoughts? So the, the reason that the 
uh, cath lab gradients are lower. When you're measuring pressure, it's essentially a peak to peak gradient. So they are looking at the maximum uh, pressure in the LV and then the maximum in the aorta when they pull it through. And so there's a certain amount of pressure recovery. And so you will notice that this peak to peak gradient is lower. When you do it on an echo, it's in it, you're getting it at the same time frame. And so because of that, the pressure gradient acro across the, the, um, the valve itself is going to be higher. So in general, the cath lab gradients are lower than your echo gradient. And then with that, we'll go over the basic views, and then I think, I think we'll wrap up for a question. So your mid-esophageal four-chamber view. You'll notice right away you can always see the left atrium quite well. The ventricle is below that, and the right atrium is sometimes cut off. We'll go over an image where if the right atrium is not cut off, it usually is a sign that the right atrium is bigger than it should be. And so starting with your echo sequence, we'll take a look at this echo report. And I'll kind of lead just in the interest of time. Um, so we always start with the left atrium uh, on, with TEE. You'll notice there's kind of a lot going on. Uh, one, you'll see that the LV is not doing a lot. Right? If we come over here, you don't see the right atrium at all. The right ventricle is not doing a lot. You have thrombus in the left ventricle, which again, you form in a low flow state. So that's consistent with having a low EF. And you'll notice that the mitral valve itself seems to be whipping opening. And so it opens and closes quickly, which tells you that the left atrial pressure is probably also high, it's equalizing with the LV pressure. So there's a lot here. This is essentially bi V dysfunction, and you have other clues that you can look at to tell you that you have a, a problem on both sides of the heart. Uh, John, what do you think of this one? Uh, the, the first thing that jumps out of me is that the in, intraatrial septum is bowed very much uh, in, to the left side, suggesting that there's a right-sided uh, volume overload. Um, the RV looks a little bit dilated. There's a catheter in it, uh, and there's some sort of turbulent flow there. I don't know if that's just agitated saline. Perfect. And so I think just as we said, we always start with the left atrium. The fact that you can see the right atrium and the bigger than the left atrium is a problem. As you said, the right ventricle is certainly bigger than the left ventricle. And one thing that I, I try to teach now and that I learned from Mike Picard, which is somewhat useful, if you're thinking of, of uh, looking at the ventricle, sometimes it's hard to actually see the bowing of the left ventricle because it's so thick. But if you then pan up to the top and you look at the atria and you realize the atria function under much lower pressures, you will see, I think, just as you pointed out right away, the right atrium bowing really into the left atrium. So this gives you a sense that there's something going on with the right heart. Uh, the next one is our long axis view. This view is nice. You are able to see the mitral and the aortic valve together, and we'll talk about why that's important. So this is a fixed view. You uh, have advanced your probe now, and you are looking at left atrium, left ventricle, aorta. Some of you have probably seen this before. Uh, John, anything jump out at you here? Uh, it looks like there's prolapse of the one of the aortic valve leaflets, I think. Um, John, what if I told you that this view was taken about 3 a.m.? <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that would make me think that the patient's in shock. Um, let's see. Not yeah, necessarily. It, why, why do you think it's in shock? Left ventricle is contracting very well. <laughs> Purely because of the 3 a.m. comment, but uh, is there a dissection flap and AI there that I'm seeing? Or there's right. something un unusual about the aortic valve. Can you see AI? Can you see AI there, John? Uh, prolapse is what I meant. I'm sorry, leaflet prolapse. So, so you, what do you see prolapsing? I see one of the, I see, I think it is the anterior leaflet of the, I'm sorry, the, um, the uh, non-coronary, uh, sorry, aortic, I, I'm jumbling my words here. The aortic valve leaflet of non-coronary is prolapsing into the ventricle, and I think I see a dissection flap just above that. So I suspect that this is an aortic dissection causing um, aortic valve dysfunction. 
So what, so what you're seeing is something prolapsing, right? Correct. So you see something prolapsing. That's number one. And number two is what's prolapsing. Correct. Okay. So it, it turns out, I think, as George alluded to, that it's certainly a dissection. It's, it's 3 a.m. But if you look at the just the size of what I think uh, Tor is mentioning, what's prolapsing through, this is a this would be a huge valve, right? So what actually you're seeing is the dissection flap coming in and out, prolapsing through the valve itself. I see. And if you focus just on the valve, you'll see that the the valve actually is is hard, it's hard to say if there's any pathology on the valve. But what you're seeing is the actual dissection flap prolapsing in and out of the LVOT. I'll see. You don't see color. If you put color on it, uh, you'll you'll notice that there's actually not a lot of blood coming back through because the the flap itself is occluding blood flow. Oh, interesting. Ken, what's the best view to get a uh, measurement of the diameter of the aorta? Yeah, uh, perfect. <laughs> so the the LV long axis view is is the uh, the best view, and part of the reason for that is you are able to measure the uh, from the LVOT all the way through the aorta. And so uh, I, I will just tell you, this is the LVOT. This is the annulus. Here we have the sinus of Valsalva, the STJ, and the ascending aorta. So you're able uh, to look at the entire aorta, I'm using my hand here, unfortunately, uh, to actually walk out into the ascending aorta. So this is certainly the best view. And, and um, I think what Gus is alluding to, this is also a view where you can use M mode because as you, you notice, if you were to put M mode across the annulus itself, you will have a very accurate measurement of uh, the actual leaflet tips themselves also. So people will often use this mode and then apply M mode. Very good. I can ask for audience, what do you think? Say that one more time, Armand. I had a hard time hearing you. So I have a question for, yeah, Trahalis, it's you again. What is the difference between echo measurements and CT measurements for the aorta? Are they going to be bigger or smaller? I, I um, there is usually a discrepancy, and I believe that the echo measurements tend to underestimate, and the CT measurements tend to overestimate. Oh, I'm sorry, vice versa. Vice versa. Echo tends to overestimate, CT tends to slightly underestimate? Uh, it could be either. The difference between CT and echo measurements would be, one, uh, CTs are orthogonal short axis, so they will give you the shortest diameter possible. Uh, echoes uh, could be cutting at an angle, so the, the diameter can be longer. The other difference is that on echo, you're measuring internal wall-to-wall -wall diameter, and on CT, you're supposed to measure the external wall-to-wall -wall diameter. So you can skew either way, but as long as you know those two factors, it can help. Perfect. Uh, let's move on. So that and get this one to loop through. What do you think here, John? I feel like I'm taking my echo ports. So this uh, this looks like uh, a mitral valve that's not moving well. It looks thickened, Great. and I see smoke in the left atrium. So I, I think this is mitral stenosis. Perfect. And you're using all of your clues. Great. So you see a lot of spontaneous echo contrast here. Stack. And would you say that the leaflets are thick and near the tips or near the base? Uh, near the tips. And Anything then I'm, we're not, we're, we're not mechanism seeing mechanism when you think of the, the tips of the leaflets. Senile uh, calcific is uh, rheumatic, perhaps. I would imagine, I would think that rheumatic would be more at the bases and moving out. I, I think this is probably more likely just degenerative calcifics, but, um, and then also we don't see the aortic valve well here, but I'm sort of just getting a, a sense that that's calcified as well, um, just from the limited amount that I see. So I think this is just degenerative. Any other thoughts? Sergey's shaking his head, so I'm wrong. I think this is more along the lines of rheumatic at the tips. The tips, okay. That's right. Bicable view. Um, so why do we need to know the bicable view? So if you're actually, this is important for Sergey since he's on the call, um, and this is the view that, that he will ask for, so you should certainly know. You're starting in the left atrium, then you're looking down in the right atrium, but the nice thing, if you're, if you're feeding lines, wires or catheters up, 
you have a sense of where it's going and how far up it's going into the SVC. So uh, one important lesson, if I can get this to play, uh, it's uh, you can't just look for the wire, you want to see the, the actual cannula coming up too. And so if we're starting in the left atrium, this is the right atrium, and you can actually see, as Sergey likes to point out in the room, this kind of double barrel sign. So you can actually see more than just a single wire. You can actually see the cannula itself, and then you can see it's kind of sitting here right up by the crista terminalis. So this is important because sometimes you will see the wire and not always see the cast, the actual cannula, and you need to uh, make sure that when they're showing you an image, you want to ask, are you actually seeing the cannula or just the wire itself? because your, your cannula can be somewhere else on the screen. And Ken, correct me if I'm wrong, or Sergey, but I think to see that double barrel, you actually have to pull the the trocar um, back, um, I think Sergey says one American foot, because if you advance that, that cannula with the trocar completely in, the blue trocar in, you won't see that double shadow. Right, so uh, when, you, when you, that's correct. When you remove it, you can actually see, uh, it will appear dark in the center. And yep. so then you, it doesn't look like you just have two wires. You can actually make out that it's a catheter itself. So that's perfect. Right. And before you wrap up, can you teach me the name of the impella view that, that we like for positioning the impella? Because I know what it yep. is, but not how to ask for it. Some of the guys know how to show it and some don't. Yep. So it's the mid-esophageal long axis view or the aortic long axis view. And you will be able to measure how deep the impella is from the annulus. Mm -hmm. So that's what, um, yeah, the impella reps will ask us to measure. So, yep. Thank you. Ken, isn't that the same view? I the the first view, long axis view that we uh, use when we look at uh, endocarditis of the aortic valve that is affecting the, uh, uh, the uh, aeromitral curtain. That's right. And the reason for that, I'll uh, uh, back up and, and we have just five minutes. If you look, let's see if I can find it here. Here we go. Uh, so I, just as Dr. Uh, Tolis is pointing out, the nice thing about the long axis view is you can actually see the mitral and the aorta together. So if you're looking at um, the, um, uh, aortomitral curtain here, you will actually see if it's thickened or if you have pathology here. Uh, it will almost always, for a very long case, it will always appear edematous. So you want to take a look, obviously, pre-op, and those are the ones where you can see endocarditis. All right. So we are almost done. Let's just fast forward here. I'll play this. LV short axis view. So the the other reason that the TEE is nice is that uh, when you advance the probe, you can actually position the probe right on the left ventricle. Um, so the images are almost uh, always beautiful. You can look at the cavity size itself. And what I'll do just to uh, compare the show you the difference, um, you can essentially look at the LV cavity and say whether it's, it's full or empty. And the management is, is completely different, right? So this is early bypass. Um, the, the uh, here we go, I'll show you here with my uh, cursor. It's completely empty. So this patient needs volume. They don't need inotrope. And if you pan over here, this is uh, an entirely different problem. Uh, this patient has a lot of volume, but the function is very poor. So they don't need more volume. They need inotropes. And so, the nice thing about just looking at the LV, uh, if you're early bypass or if you're in the ICU, is it will give you a clue in terms of the management strategy. This one should be pretty obvious. Um, you are essentially looking at an effusion. Keep in mind that the right heart here on the top of the screen is, is compressed. So the right heart compresses before the, the left ventricle. And so uh, sometimes uh, people will look at the left ventricle and say, well, I see a cavity, we can't be in tamponade. Um, the reason that the CVP goes up is that uh, tamponade is a right-sided problem and it's filling the left ventricle. So uh, if you're able to see that the right ventricle is completely collapsed or the right atrium first is completely collapsed, that's usually a sign that you're gonna start to have hemodynamic compromise after that. So 
anytime you look at the venture for the LV, it's okay to look at that, but see if you can look at the RV. If the R, if the RA and the RV are completely collapsed, then you're going to have a problem. And that, that's a good example of the D sign as well, the septum being voted out. That's right, John. So uh, depending on, on the kind of two issues going on here, if you have enough compression on the right side of the heart, you will essentially flatten the septum. People typically talk about the D sign or flattening when you have high um, right-sided pressures uh, coming intravascular, but you can also have compression external to that that will flatten the septum as well. And then here, this will be the, the last slide. And then I'll skip to the end. Um, the It's important uh, when you, um, when you're thinking of the LV to remember your anatomy, so you have LAD, circumflex, and RCA. But keep in mind, uh, this is a TTE view, right? Because uh, you're starting on top of the heart. When you're doing a TEE, it's reversed because you're starting behind the heart. Um, so the circumflex, there's almost never a question of, but for people that are doing a lot of TTEs and TEEs, you need to be careful, especially if you're in the OR and you see some uh, wall motion abnormalities on the bottom of your screen if you're in the OR to recognize that this is actually anterior territory. Um, and so that, as we mentioned, the TTE and the TEE are flipped. So I'm going to give you an example and then I will ask you what vessel you should be worried about here. So, John, I'll tell you, you're, you're in the OR and you're coming off bypass. Mm -hmm. and you, and you so have one it, minute to do it. It, it looks to me like, like the superior aspect of my screen there is not moving well, which would be the inferior wall of the heart. So I'm worried about the RCA. Perfect. And let's say uh, you're in the ICU and you've asked for a TTE and you're looking at the top here. So if it's a TTE, then that would be the anterior wall of the heart and it would be an LAD lesion that I would be okay. talking about. Perfect. Great. And then the I will skip now to the very last slide here. And I kind of mentioned this already. Um, I was asked, so certainly what's better, the TTE or the TEE? Uh, it depends on what you're looking for. I think for most of us on this call, the nice thing about the TE when you don't have uh, chest tubes and, and uh, body habitus can be a challenge. Keep in mind that you're starting with the TEE that's already very close to the heart. So you can have a very junior sonographer put in a TEE probe and get excellent views. Um, the TTE will depend on the person that's doing the echo. And depending on the patient, they may not be able to get a great view either. Um, so if you're concerned, it's always better, I think, to push for a TEE. That way you know exactly what's going on before you go back to the OR. You make any uh, difference. <sighs> the last slide, uh, it's 8.30. Um, I will actually give you this reference card. We spent a fair amount of time going over TEE. Um, I will hand this out. I think, again, it's important anytime you're going to do a case to review the TTE loops, and this will help. And that will essentially give you a lot of what you need to know in the TEE coming out of the OR as well, because you will understand the pathology going in and then you will be able to see is there a difference. And you will notice that once you train your eye to understand TEE, if you're spending a lot of time in the OR, it will make the TTE loops uh, much easier to understand because they're, as I mentioned earlier, mirror images of each other. So we're at uh, 8.31. Quick questions. 